Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Pastor Buck Schaefer from Grace Life Church. Ray Heifel from Providence Presbyterian Church. Pete Giacalone from the Rainbow Temple Assembly Guy Church, McKeesport, Pennsylvania. J. Anthony Gilbert, Kingdom Restoration Christian Center, Mount Washington. Oh, well, this, this is a good group. I can't wait to hear the oh. answers today. I mean, this, this is going to be awesome. Guys, so Bill called in and he asked us this question. He said, is it okay if someone is on their deathbed to ask God to be merciful and to take them home to heaven? So just to set, set the, yeah. I think what we're talking about here is, again, up it's life. Not, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a deathbed conversion so much as it is, can't, is it all right for us to pray the Lord take him home? Would you mind if we handled it both ways? Go where you want to go, oh, okay. It's all right. <laughs> well, if we're going to look at the one way to, uh, as far as giving up your spirit, I don't think, I don't think there's any sin in that for, for you to, but you know, Paul comes down and says, he, remember Ray, he said, I, finish, I fought my fight, yeah. I finished the race, and Paul was ready to go home. But he still left it in God's mm -hmm. divine providence mm -hmm. So if you're in your deathbed and you know in your deathbed, and I, I've been by uh, people who have died. Uh, Marie McCamish, all of you know Harold, uh, when, her, when his mother Marie was dying, I, I walked in to pray for her and, and she looked right at me very sternly. She goes, don't you dare pray for me. I said, and Harold was there in the family. Don't you? I said, Marie, she goes, I want to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, if that's your wish. And she didn't live much longer. We, we prayed that God would receive her. I don't think there's any sin in that. Pete, I've done the same thing. I've okay. been at people's bedside and, right. and I prayed for, you know, Lord, if it's your will, would you heal them? But if not, you know, please don't let them suffer mm -hmm. long and take them home. And, and mm -hmm. we've actually gotten to the point where, I mean, I was praying that prayer for people and the Lord would take them the next day. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I know as a Christian, you know, when you're in suffering, when you're in pain, when, you know, by all looking at all the facts and details, there's almost no possibility God's going to heal you at this right. point, you know, right. you're ready to go home. I, I think it's, I think it's a, it's, it's a mercy from God when yeah. he takes someone quickly. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it says you, everyone has an appointment with death, yeah. but as I was there with my father holding his hand on his deathbed, he had this horrible cancer and he was suffering for days. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when you go back to the scripture, it says, if you ask anything, anything. according to his there will, go, well, well, we have our own free will and he didn't want to suffer anymore. Mm. And so he hugged his family, kissed his wife, and uh, they said, they don't know what happened. His spirit just left his body. So, you wow. know, suffering, suffering, you know, in this present time, we wanted to be minute when you're on your deathbed. And we knew that healing wasn't going to take place. So right. thank God he didn't have to suffer. It, it relieved me to know he was in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, and when you're praying, you know, it's not like your prayers move the sovereignty of God when he there doesn't want to move. So I don't know if there's much you can ask mm -hmm. that I think is wrong per se. Right. I mean, there may be some things, obviously, you can get into a debate about it. But in regards to should I pray it, just because you pray it doesn't mean God has to do it. You know, so you can pray, God, I want a million dollars. Ain't wrong to pray it, but God may say, well, good luck with that one. You know? Go to seats, you know, go to seats, get a lot of them. Let's see what happens. Right. I know of a, of a situation. Uh, I'm chaplain of the fire department and police department in McKeesport. And one of the firemen, we we're talking about death one day, and one of the firemen came to me and was telling me his dad took a heart attack in, in he was rototilling the garden. He took a heart attack. Neighbor came over and resuscitated him. And the father said, what are you doing? Why'd you bring me back? He saw heaven and, and, and he was real, literally yelling at the guy for bringing him back. So they brought him into the house. They called 911 and all the rest. And, and then he really did pass on the couch. But he really got mad at the people for resuscitating him because he- Well, well, he, well let's, let's go there, Pete, because that, that's the question I think that we probably face more often is, so we have a loved one who do, do, you know, do we continue to prolong their life? You know, families face this. Do they take them off? You know, how does a family deal with that, that situation mm -hmm. where there's, uh, you know, the, you want to always err on the side of life, but sometimes it's time to let them go. You know, I tell people all the time, even like someone that's in a bad relationship, maybe they're in an adulterous relationship, and uh, the Bible says you could get out. 
you have to know in your own heart. You have to follow your own peace, I believe, in that situation. So if you want them on life support, I think you need to determine what do you, the family, want? Uh, what did the person that's on life support want and honor their wishes? Because I personally, I don't believe they're living if they need a, a machine to keep them alive. If they're breathing for them, keeping their mm -hmm. heart going, all that, they're not really living. No, so not technically, God has no. removed himself, or mm -hmm. removed the ability for them to live. So I feel at that point, it comes down to following your own peace. Yeah, I agree with that, Jay. I think, especially today, with all the different medical options, number one, the doctors can't guarantee that any one treatment's going to work anyway. Um, so mm -hmm. it's not like we're required to do what the doctor says is the best. They don't always know what the best thing is. So I think we use our wisdom, we listen to the doctors, but when you're in a situation where, you know, I remember a, a woman at the previous church where, you know, they were amputating body part after body oh. part because of the sugar diabetes was getting worse and worse. And, and uh, at one point, you know, that she just said, enough, I'm not going to, you're not going to cut any more off of me. And, you know, eventually she died from it. But I, I just couldn't imagine saying, well, you have to continue to do every possible thing that the doctor says is the most percentage of, of, of prolonging life. I don't think that's the case. I think, you know, we don't try to kill ourselves. We don't, right, you, know, right. you know, end life, but we don't have to do something that the doctor says, you know, 55% chance this is going to work. If we think that's going to be too much pain or suffering, we can just let, you know, leave it in God's hands, I think. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this then. Uh, deathbed <clears throat> conversion. You know, when I first read this, I thought that's what yes, they might have been talking about. But yes. have you seen it? Have you seen someone come to the place where yeah. they've walked away from God their entire life, but at the last minute you went in there and led them to the Lord? Well, I, I, again, going back to a, <clears throat> uh, a chaplain of uh, the chief called me one day, said, Pastor, we have one of our retirees. He's on his deathbed. Would you go pray for him? Uh, man, I... I beelined over to the hospitals, you know, over there in McKeesport. And this was a big fireman, and he was probably close to his 80s, but he was still a massive man. And, and the daughter stops me just as I'm going in, and we're talking. She goes, please pray that God takes my father home. Now, the thing I was struggling with, does he know the Lord? Mm -hmm. I mean, he had yeah. tubes all over him. And I was taught long ago as a young pastor, you talk to them because they do hear you. So I walked in, I put my hand wherever I could touch him on the shoulder. I said, hey, I'm Pastor Pete. I'm your chaplain. I'm chaplain of the fire department. And I came here to tell you about Jesus. And I'm getting louder. I mean, you could hear me through the whole of uh, wow. Well, because I wanted to make sure he heard me. Yeah, yeah. I said, I'm going to pray a sinner's prayer. Would you pray that prayer with me? And he nodded. His, his eyes opened up and he nodded. So I, so I uh, prayed the sinner's prayer. And I, and I looked at him, I said, now, let me know, did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? And he's blinking his eyes, his eyes are real big, and, and, uh, and, and it brought such a peace to my heart. And when I was leaving, I turned to him, I said, um, hey, I'll be back. And he, I mean, his hand was a massive hand, and he just waved to me. Mm -hmm. And he died within a half hour later. Wow. Wow. So, um, yeah, I really believe in deathbed conversions. I really believe that. Amen. Well, I, I think we have one in the Bible, right? We have right, the thief right. on the cross who, right. you know, the one gospel account says both of them were mocking him. So I think what we see here is that he, this guy was mocking him too for a while. And then, and then he's convicted and the Holy Spirit uh, converts yeah. him on the cross and he defends Jesus. He confesses his sins to Christ. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Right. Of course, what's Jesus say? Today you'll be, be with, with me you. in paradise. Guaranteed. So I think, yeah, he is told you're going to heaven. <laughs> he was converted at the very end on the cross. And so, you know, it, it certainly is possible. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that it's important to remind people you ought not to depend on that. <laughs> no, 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 I think, no, I think it's, I think wait, it's man, unlikely. Man. It's Amen. unlikely if you've, you know, yeah. resisted God your whole life that your heart's going to be softened at the end. I think you're living dangerously if you're counting on the deathbed Amen. confession. I think if you don't turn to Christ while, you know, the, the grass is green, so to speak, you know, you, more and more you're going to be hardened. And the, the, the likelihood of that, I think, is less and less. Amen. Well, I, I know of a situation back in Detroit. Frank Majeski was this guy's name, and he was a motorcycle dude. And, and he said, and everyone was witnessing to him. And he said, well, one day I'll give my life to Christ. But what happened was a, a drug deal went bad, and the guy went up, shot him, and the bullet went right up through his nose and lodged right in here because he thought, I'll call on Christ whenever I want to mm -hmm. because he was witnessed to so much. And he said that the only thing he could, he couldn't think of Christ. The only thing he, could, he was suffocating on his own blood. And he, he said the only thing he could think about was breathing. They got him stabilized. He gave his life to Christ and became a, oh my, thousands got saved in his ministry. But 
like you said, mm -hmm. don't, don't, yeah. because how many? I mean, that was my testimony. You know, I'll, I'll come to Christ when I'm old, you know, yeah. because I wanted to live for sin, yeah. which mm -hmm. is, I think, that shows where your heart is. You're dead in sins. You love sin and you're kidding yourself. You don't want to come to Jesus until there's nothing left, you know, <laughs> worth living for. But, you know, what do you really think about Jesus at that yeah. point? You hate him. So I think, you know, if you're, if you're playing that game and you oh. think that, you know, well, just before I die, I'm going to come to the Lord. That shows me that you have a hard heart right now and you should cry out to God to repent because, again, God could be merciful and change your heart at the last moment. But I think that that you're doesn't gambling. happen very often. Well, and, and if you are in a situation where you're watching this program and you're enjoying the questions, but you're like, I don't really know where I stand with God. I don't really know where my life is. And I don't want to get to my deathbed and not be sure of my salvation. Well, you can call on Christ. You can also call a prayer partner and they can lead you down the road that results in you having that relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't put that off. No, I mean, don't, don't wait until something drastic happens till you find yourself in a situation where you just, you, you know, you, you, then you say, well, then I'll call. Well, you might not have that time. But today, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Amen. So if you're watching this right now, take that moment, call the prayer partner and get a hold of them and say, I need to know the Lord. And you will have the best deathbed situation you could possibly have because you'll know where you are going. You'll know who you know. Well, stay tuned for more hard questions right after this. Well, welcome back to Hard Questions, where we try to answer your hard questions. These guys do a pretty good job of it, too. We have a, a great one here, pastors, that I think it affects everyone. Uh, what is fear? And is being fearful a sin? And how do you stop fearing? Amen. You know, I, I think according to the scripture, uh, the Bible would declare that, that fear is a spirit. Mm. And, and the Bible tells us fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So, you know, and you got all these acronyms that people preach, false evidence that appears real. But, you know, oh, did you have that in your notes? <laughs> I didn't even use your cheat sheet. Uh, okay. But I was thinking about it, and, and I was thinking about, you know, and, and people say, well, the, the opposite of fear is faith. Amen. And, that, and people say when faith comes in, fear goes out. When fear comes in, faith goes out. But if you look at the scripture, I kind of changed that for myself anyway, because perfect love casts out all fear. There you go. So he that fears hasn't been made perfect in the love of God. So I, I think the opposite of fear is love. When you understand and trust and know mm -hmm. and believe God's love for you and experience it, all of a sudden fear mm -hmm. is uh, it torment. It says fear, mm -hmm. torment is, is cast out. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like if you understand God's perfect love, it'll dispel all fear. And, and, and to go along exactly, of course, you did take all my notes there, but that's, that's okay. He goes, I can't read that. That's an Italian. <laughs> I wrote in tongues. You can interpret. I know you can. But, but again, when we look in the scriptures, it talks about uh, I go through a progression. In other words, whatever is not of faith is of sin. sin. Exactly. Now, we find that in Romans. But what would cause me not to be a faith? A faith? And that's the reason why fear is a very real thing. And, and um, you know, again, Paul wrote Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So I really believe fear does need to be dealt with head on yeah. because if it has that, if it is given the, uh, the ability to grow, I think our faith is going to wane. That's right. And I think we're going to find ourselves in sin. And I also think that you mentioned about faith and fear. Uh, the Bible also says that faith worketh by love. Right. So because really you can't have faith in someone that you don't believe yeah. has your best interest yeah. at heart. Yeah. And so one of the things I think about fear and faith, they both deal in the arena of the imagination. If you Ooh, think about it, good, whether you good. have faith or fear, yeah. they both deal with the unseen of what you believe mm -hmm. is going to it's happen. So how do you get rid of fear is by feeding your faith, your imagination, yeah. your sanctified imagination through the word of God that mm -hmm. starves that mm -hmm. fear because you got to feed one or the other. Good. One of them have to be fed. And That's when right. you feed your faith according to the word of God, you begin to imagine right. what God's possibilities are and fear has to go away. So you have to make a decision which one you're going to feed. Well, you guys handled this one side of it well. I think the sinful fear that we can have, the fear of the world, the yeah. fear of sin, right? The right. fear of the devil, which, which we ought not never to have because mm -hmm. greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world, right? But there's also the element, and we don't want to lose this, right? That scripture talks about. I know where you're going. The fear of the Lord Amen. is the beginning of wisdom, yeah. right? And, you know, uh, when the Apostle Paul is talking about 
some of the just marks of the wickedness of his day, you know, he sort of summarized it as at the end, you know, that, you know, that they, uh, they love evil and all these things with their tongues, they speak this and that. And then he, at the very end, he says, and there is no fear of God before their eyes. You know, it, it's, a, it's the, the height of a mark of an ungodly age yeah, that no good. one fears the Lord. And that's good. the one thing that we need more of. I think mm -hmm. Jesus in, in Hebrews 5, it says that he was heard by, you know, in as many prayers yeah. when he was on earth, because of his godly fear. Yeah. You know, I think in Christ, you have the fear of God perfect, even as you have no sinful right. fear at all, right? Right. right? He never feared man. He never mm -hmm. feared Satan. Right. But his fear of the Lord was perfect. You know, I, I like that. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. And I feel like even in Romans 1, when they didn't have honor right. and reverence, mm -hmm. and that, that word in the New Testament actually comes out as an awe, an awe and a wonder for God and a reverence for his word. Not like a quivering Lion King, I quiver with fear. It's like God is in this place and he is awesome. And when they sense God and they knew God, they didn't worship him. They had no respect. Mm -mm. They had no fear of God. Mm -hmm. and, and I like that, that, that side of that. Well, I was going to kind of ask the question because I'm sure there's probably people at home saying, well, what's the difference okay, between right. the fear yeah. of God and fear? So I wanted to kind of pose that question. I think as, as both men brought out, Jay, I, I believe, and, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, if you do study on those words, the one is a reverence, a, mm -hmm. a, a reverential mm -hmm. yeah. fear of God, fear of Spare. who he is, his authority, his power, his domain. Mm -hmm. right. And so that is a good fear. That's mm -hmm. what we want. The other fear, as you know, is a tormenting fear mm -hmm. that, er and I come from a Sicilian background, and I know you're Italian, I know you're Italian, and Jay, you're good looking like Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, sorry. It's not in there, Pete. It's not in there. It's not like Prigo, it's in there. <laughs> it's okay, but you're okay. Thanks, appreciate it. But, uh, but um, now I forgot where I was going. Well, let, me just, well, let, me, let, me just, let me just go here with this because, you know, w the Bible tells us to be anxious for nothing. So mm. we're, we're, there's, a, there's a sense that we're right. not supposed right. to fear. We're supposed to trust in the Lord. Right. But yet, as we've said, we have this fear of God, which is this holy reverence and, right. and righteous, righteous fear. But there's something that our next question kind of fits right into this. Mm. And it says, if Christians are forgiven... Why are we going to be judged? Because again, Buck, you, you mentioned that uh, perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves judgment, it goes on to say, and we're not gonna be judged, but yet there's things that say we are gonna be judged. Well, you know, this is, this is a, a big topic because you could get into revelations and the white throne judgment, this judgment, but I love the scripture that it says over in, uh, where's it at? It's in Corinthians. Five, one through 10. Pete, you're still <laughs> out of my I'm notes. still each other's yeah. notes here. <laughs> but, We're but gonna separate you two. But, but what about 1131? <laughs> okay. You didn't get that. And uh, you know, I where, where you, it buddy. talks about judge yourself lest ye be judged. So we could, we could talk about and debate this and say, you know, you're going to be judged for the things you did in the body. We can go back to the New Testament and say every man will be judged according to what he says. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but listen, if, if we really focus and don't rightly divide the word of truth, we can end up on, on one side or the other side. We can end up back in fear, fear of judgment. Mm -hmm. But perfect love casts out all fear. But I feel like I, I want to get to the end of my life and be judged for the works that I did in the body in this life. But I also want to judge myself every day mm -hmm. through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we can listen to spirits of condemnation and we can say, wait a minute, we all fall short of the glory of God. But I want to wake up and go, Lord, your mercies are new every morning. And I want to judge myself, Lord, repenting today, living with a spirit of humility and repentance and judging myself looking at myself through the blood of Jesus and through the finished work of Christ, because isn't that what righteousness is? Because if we come to God on our own righteousness, Forget now will God take all the sin that was placed on Christ and judge us for that? That's why I feel sometimes the body of Christ is, man, I did that wrong. God's going to put that to my account. Well, wait, either the blood of Jesus did right. away with it right. or it's still at your account. And right. if it's at your account, you ain't even getting in, yeah. dog, yeah. right? Yeah. right. So, right. So, so how do we deal with that, pastors? Yeah. Here we good. go. Let me, let, let me jump in here. The verse that I think you were headed for in verse 10. For we must all appear, and he's talking about Christians, before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive, receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So yes, there is going to be a judgment for the believer, but it's not going to be the type of judgment right. where it's heaven or hell. 
It's going to be for the works we've done. Go ahead, Ray. I'm sorry. Oh, no, amen. I, that's exactly what I was going to say, that if you're in Christ, the condemnation's been paid. God right. would be wrong to judge right. you again. Right. But, you know, as a Christian, I am called to live for Christ. And Jesus does make promises like, you know, even a cup right. of cold water right. will not lose his reward. Right. And we're going to be judged for rewards yes. before the Lord. Now, that's Paul... Right warns us though, you know, you may build on it wood, hay and stubble and it's going to be burned up Fair and that's enough. the suffering loss. You're not going to lose heaven, but you're going to lose rewards that you yeah. would have had. And right. I think that's an incentive for us to live yeah. the Christian life, to know that's that right. God, you know, yeah. because of the blood of Jesus, he right. accepts yes. my imperfect works. Right. And even, even the smallest thing done for Jesus yeah. out of real faith in him, yeah. imperfect, but real, real love for him. Again, imperfect, but real, God's going to accept that. God's going to well, reward well, that. Just, and we're up against a break, but just some Christians, though, some Christians are going through condemnation. Yeah. Have I done enough, Lord? Have yeah. I followed you right? You know, they're getting to, yeah. to the end of their yeah. life. Again, yeah. going back to the deathbed question. And they're saying, Am I, did, I, did I take yeah. response? What, what would you say, pa Pastor Jay? What would you say to someone who's in that kind of, kind of framework? Well, they're operating out of fear. Uh, mm -hmm. Either Christ forgave you or he didn't. If you mm -hmm. prayed the prayer of salvation, ask Christ into your heart, as we've all said, mm -hmm. you know, them sins have been washed away. They've mm -hmm. been completely forgiven. Yes. And now, yeah. though, what the judge, there's the great wine throat judgment, as you mentioned, which is for the unbeliever. And then you have the judgment seat of Christ, which also says in Romans 14, 10, that mm -hmm. we're going to stand before that. And so I believe that when you're being, now you need to be looking at how am I stewarding the mm -hmm. grace given to me? Mm -hmm. right. Because that's what you're going to be judged according. That's why he said one man had five, one man had two, another man had one, mm -hmm. talking about the talents. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. So how well do we steward mm -hmm. what God gave us? And that's going to determine the rewards that we have. So we don't need to operate in fear. We need to operate in faith saying, God, may I maximize everything that you've given me. That's great. You know, real quick, if you if you had fear in your marriage and a relationship mm -hmm. and you go, my wife's going to Sands, I wonder if she's going to meet another guy. I wonder what's going on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, people don't understand this, but in the scripture, in the Bible, it tells us, man, this is about relationship. Right. This yeah. is about confidence in how mm -hmm. much somebody loves me. Mm -hmm. And there's response to that. Yeah. Therefore, there's no, no, there's no fear in love. Mm -hmm. So if you have to live that way, exactly. I'd question how strong is your relationship and knowing yeah, the good. character of God, right. because yeah. when you you say cry out to him, Abba, Daddy. Mm -hmm. He loves you. When you know that love, all of a sudden that relationship's strong Amen. and that care and that That's fear right. and anxiety and condemnation is pushed out. And, and we must never forget, yes, we are sa we're saved to do good works, That's right. but we're not saved by, by our by works. Amen. Saved Amen. to do, Amen. but not saved by. Yep. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate that. And there's been so many times uh, when I prayed on the prayer line with people here and they would say, what, they have this condemnation. Yeah. I say, God loves you so much and he paid yeah. so high Amen. a price for you. He is not giving you up. You don't have to worry Amen. about unforgivable sin. We'll get into that some other time. But uh, uh, we're going to be right back after this with more of your hard questions. Well, we like to end the program with scripture. And today we go to Joshua where it says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go, Joshua 1, 9. So pastors, what do you think about Joshua? <laughs> well, well, I'm gonna jump in because I know what, um, here's a man stepping into the epitome of, uh, of the best pastor ever known to mankind. And God says, listen, Stepping in here, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged for I'm going to be with you and I want to give somebody else a chance. Well, I think it's important to realize you're going to have fear, but courage built up with faith will overcome every fear in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that, you know, Martin Luther said, we don't fear God the way we fear our torturer, but the way we would fear and respect our father. And, you know, a, an obedient child loves his father, doesn't want to mm -hmm. disappoint him. And that's the way we fear the Lord. And that's also the way we don't fear that's anything good. else. It's good. Mm -hmm. I feel like this scripture, like you said, Pete, was written to a leader, right. a leader that was emerging, not having all the experience Moses did. And for leaders, whatever you lead, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, don't be discouraged, encourage yourself That's in the right. Lord. That's right, because God is with you wherever you go. Have a great day. <laughs>